All right, so what, what I want to do today, the last lecture, is uh, I can't say finish up. There's a lot of more material I could cover uh, at the time, but at least uh, do more on, on the fertility question, and especially on the interaction between fertility <coughs> and capital. I, I mean, fertility is a big question in its own right, uh, very important for a lot of questions. But I'm going to be mainly concentrating on its interaction with fertility, with um, human capital investment. So you recall that we we, we said, well, let's assume, we'll go back to the parental utility function, let's assume that's separable. in three arguments, parental consumption and number of children age human capital per child. I won't get a chance really to prove it, but one can show with more general functions than this, if you have concavity in the utility that you get from investing in children, children are identical, etc., and then they'll all end up with the same human capital investment as an equilibrium outcome. I'm just assuming it here, but you can think of it as an equilibrium outcome under some conditions. And other conditions you won't get it, but a lot of the analysis I'm going to give will still go through, even if not all the human capitals are the same. Okay, so it's not really as big an assumption as people think. It's not an unreasonable assumption that parents tend to equalize human capital. Okay? Now, I'll assume the usual concavity about all these functions. So, G double prime, U double prime, and V double prime less than zero, and of course, Z prime, U prime, V prime greater than zero. So, it's con con is separable, concave, uh, and there, you know, in ordinary circumstances, we know some basic results about such functions. For example, all, uh, all the um, elasticities will be positive. Okay? So think of that result back in mind. That's the traditional result. Um, and we're going to show <coughs> that doesn't necessarily hold in our analysis. Okay? And that's because of the budget equation. So think of the expenditures on children. I don't know, I'll call those expenditures on children as equal to PNN, I'll define these terms in a moment, PH, H, plus P, N, H. So, P, N, is cost of each child, and fixed, fixed cost of each child, independent of quality. So, for example, Mother, the mother has to go through a nine-month gestation period, uh, a lot of costs of her time, a lot of labor force, the discomfort, all, all that. Uh, that's independent of what the quality of the child is going to be, basically, right? So that's all PN is. Now, PVH is cost of unit human capital independent of number of children. Well, that, that's less clear. I mean, there are examples one can give of that. For example, um, you can say that you read to all your children at the same time. So the cost uh, is independent of how many children you're reading to. The cost is your time. Uh, you, they live in a common space. So that if you have the space because of some you know, minimum space needed, you can have <coughs> several children living in the same space. <coughs> it may hand me down clothes from one child to the next. 
books. I mean, there are a bunch of examples of that. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to put it in because I'll need. I won't need it, but it's, it's important to show how different. Why this analysis differs. I think it's less important than the P n, but it's there. Okay. And then P is the variable cost of investing in each child. Now, some net variable cost. Um, In, in a more general analysis, remember we thought of, uh, that what really entered the parental utility function was the earnings of, uh, of children and so on. And we'll give some application along those lines. But for now, think of it the simpler way that all that enters in, in, in the parental utility function is the amount of H, not the valuation of the H. Well, I'll modify that some later on, okay, in, in a certain way at least. All right, so. Then income, the income constraint, if, if, you know, if C is the numerator, it would be C of P plus all these things, P N, N, parental income, plus P H, H, plus P N H, right? And so we have a, a traditional, uh, well, a maximization, constraint maximization, probably maximizing that subject to this constraint, um, and so far it looks pretty straightforward. Okay. So if we look at our first order conditions on this. Well, we get g prime of c p is equal to lambda, right? U prime of n, a little more complicated, is equal to lambda. Now what? What, where does n enter? Well, n enters in two places. The fixed cost, you can't speak the variable cost, so it's Pn plus Ph. We call this lambda pi n. And V prime of H is equal lambda times Ph. And what's important to recognize it is that the relevant prices, the relevant prices in this analysis are the pies. They're the shadow prices that enter into the, uh, you know, that's the marginal cost of having, pi n is the marginal cost of having an additional child. It depends upon the fixed and variable costs, and pi h is the marginal cost of investing an additional unit in each child. It depends on fixed and variable cost. But the interesting aspect of that is that what these prices depend upon are endogenous variables, namely pi n depends on h. So the higher h, the higher pi n. I'll come back to y, pretty simply y. And the higher n, the higher pi, or, what did I say? Uh, let me repeat it, make sure. Pi n depends on h, so the higher h, the higher pi n, and pi h depends on n. And the reason is pretty clear. Um, look at pi h, this term here. This depends on n, why? Because if you increase a unit of h, right, you get this marginal utility, what's the cost? Well, the cost is some fixed cost, well, it's a variable cost, so the more kids you have, since you're increasing the human capital of each child, the more kids you have, the greater the cost of increasing that. Okay. So that's where the assumption about each kid gets the same human capital directly enters. Now, if you had some relation, let's say each kid got a fraction of some basic kid's human capital, or 
you have a much more general function where this property would hold. As long as the, pro the important property is that uh, when you increase H on one kid, you increase it also on other kids. That's the important property. Maybe not by the equal amounts and so on, but in the simplest case, it's they're all equal. Okay. So that's pi H. Now pi N has a similar interpretation. If I increase the number of children, well, what's the cost? Well, that's the cost of raising each child, at least at the margin. And that's going to depend upon how much you're investing in each child. Sure, that's a choice variable. But still, uh, in terms of affecting your behavior, your behavior is going to be very different if you're investing a little bit in each child versus you're investing more. That's the insight you have to understand. Any questions? Okay. And it's the endogeneity of these shadow prices the that they depend upon. They're not, even though the P N and the P H and the P's we take as exogenous, right? It's the endogeneity of the shadow prices, the pies that really generates the, the uh, quantity, quality, the uh, number and human capital interaction that is, is well known in the fertility and human capital literature. Now these are the first order conditions. Second order conditions, well you might say these are sufficient that you have concavity quasi-concavity in the overall utility function. But it's not true in this case. And it's not true why. Why is it true? It's not true because the usual problem, we have linear budget constraints. In this case, we don't have a linear budget constraint. This budget constraint here is not linear in the variables that we're choosing. It, it, and the, it, it, if this is all we had, if P was zero, we'd have straight linear budget constraint. But because of this, we have the product of these two terms. So we don't have a linear budget constraint. Actually, we have a convex budget constraint, right? If you, if you solve for dn, dh, let's say holding cp constant, that's going to be equal to minus pi h over pi n. And then if you take the second derivative, maybe use the first derivative, that second derivative is going to be positive. Okay. So, yeah. All right, so we're going to have a convex, and you work, work that out, but just take the second derivative and it'll be positive. Okay. So we have a convex budget constraint. Okay. So what you really need for the second order condition, this is important, not just a little technical point. What you really need for the budget constraint is that the indifference curves, yeah, let's say we had n and h over here, and we draw here the budget constraint, budget. And the indifference curve, I'm going to be at an optimum, the indifference curve u, that has to be more convex than the budget constraint. So in the usual case, the budget constraint is linear. So if you have a convex indifference curve, then you satisfy that condition, right? If the budget constraint is also convex, then just having a convex indifference curve isn't enough. Okay. Now you might say that well, that's that's a detail, but it isn't a detail. It's crucial. And you can see it from the picture. You understand what's going on. You know, if if you get a change in price, see an ordinary case. 
linear. Which would apply here, P equals zero. I'll show you that later on, okay? And then you get a change in the price of eight, pH. Let's say that, that becomes more expensive. You compensate it, you go here, okay? So this would be, uh, in this particular case, this here is I over pH and I over pN. And you change it, you move along your convex in different here. So the magnitude of the change depends upon, of course, the magnitude of the price change and the convexity in different here. Now think of a similar experiment going on. I'm going to change the prices, the shadow prices. Could be the, these direct prices. Uh, right? Could be any of those. We stop. So this, this thing becomes, I'd say, steeper. Okay. What happens? Well, so it's going to cut through here, but as we move in this direction, the let's say if the price of H goes up, as we reduce N, uh, in, uh, reduce H and increase N, that's affecting the shadow prices. So let's say the price, the shadow price of H goes up. Okay. What happens? Well, you start. Reducing H and increasing N and maybe C, uh, C. okay? Start, but reducing H and, and increasing N, right? It, it, separable utility, that's what you'd have. But what happens? But as you do that, as you re increase N and reduce H, you further raise the price of H. And that made you want to shift further. And you keep you're chasing your tail, so to speak. You keep going further and further. Now, the second order condition guarantees, in general, you won't go to the corner. If you didn't have the second order condition, what would you do? Well, you would either have no N, I mean, it's po logically possible with a separable utility fund, it makes no sense, although in, in a real utility fund, you, you can't have N, you just have H, right? <laughs> I mean, but you can just have a very low N, a lot of H, that is reasonable, or a lot of N, and little h. May you get that anyway. But you would expect big responses to really small changes. Right? Because you get these endogenous prices that begin to function. All right, Christina, you following that? You see why that's happening? The endogenous prices. Why that's affecting the consequences of changing price of H or N. So you keep reinforcing that, and you end up, let's say, with an interior solution on the, with you know the right assumptions, just like you would with a linear budget constraint. But the response is going to be really big. Response is going to be big relative to what you would get if there's no interaction. That's the that's the standard to use for that. Okay. Well, not only does it raise price response. You can also distort income responses. And that, I'll show you a little in more detail. All right? So, I mean, to make it simple, just working out the algorithm could be worked out more generally, very easily. But I'll make it simple. I'll say, you know, C is fixed, parental consumption is fixed, so we ignore it, and we have basically U of N plus V of H. C 
subject to I, subject to I is equal P N N plus P H H plus P N H. Okay? And now we have the first order conditions, which we can write that U prime of N divided by pi of N is equal to V prime of H divided by pi of H, right? First order condition. So we can, we can rewrite that in the following way. Oh, substitute for pi of H, so that's pH plus pn times u prime of n is equal to pn plus pH times V prime of H. Okay. So we have these two equations. So now we want to differentiate with respect to these two equations with respect to, um, let's say, income. Suppose income changed. Well, if we look at this, we would have Pn dn the income plus pH dH the income plus pH dN the income plus pN dH the income is equal to 1. Well, by combining terms, we would get what? Well, we would have pi n plus pH, which is nice. Pi n plus pH, which is what? That's pi n, the n. Right? So these derivatives are multiplied by their shadow prices. That's what you're multiplying the derivatives of each of these changes by. Plus pH plus pn times d h di is equal to 1. All right? So that would be the differentiation of the budget constraint. Another way to write that is pi n times, let me write, let me be careful always writing this, pi n dn di plus pi h di di is equal to 1. Okay, now we want to differentiate the first order condition. It's a little more complicated, but nothing, nothing difficult. Um, what do we have? Well, we differentiate the first order condition here. We'd end up with the following. I'll make sure I don't make any mistakes. P I'm pretty sure I'm only going to say not sure. pH plus PN U N N D N D I then minus P V H so it's very symmetrical plus Pn plus pH VHH is equal to zero. Okay. Um, I have to stop multiply this time, so I'm sorry. We need the DVDH there. So we have these two comparative stacks equations to solve. Solutions are pretty straightforward. Um, what we'll get, so let me break it down into several steps. Okay? Let's push this up. 
P was equal to zero. So there's no interaction. Just these fixed costs per unit. So P is zero. P is zero. U N N less than zero. V H H less than zero. So if we look at, say, solve for D N di, in this case, we have some determinant here, which would be less than zero because, you know, if the p's are zero, we just look, if the p's are zero, this drops out, so we'll just have pn here, and this drops out, we just have ph here, and in these, in these conditions, we would have the first term drops out, so all you have is the negative unn, First term drops out there, and you have the negative VHH, right? And so you get the ordinary determinant that's going to be negative because, simply because, UN VHH is less than zero, okay? And what would the numerator be? Well, you know, the usual rule, we replace that, and we get the numerator would be VHH, very classical type of result, P sub N, and this is less than zero. And so the whole thing is greater than zero. No surprise, it should not be any surprise, that if we had no interaction in the budget constraint, the additive utility function, both goods are superior. I mean, well, generally they'll both be superior, but surely in this case, they'll both be superior. I mean, a little technical point, you know, you can have additive separability, and if not both functions are concave, there's some cases where you can get one good and many goods actually inferior in a multi-good case, but we don't have that. We have a concavity, so it's pretty straightforward. Okay? Did you have a question? No? Okay. All right. Same thing would be true for H. It could also be true that something symmetrical is basically this. Right. This should be I. Okay? The HDI would be equal equal to equal to U and N PH over D less than zero, less than zero, greater than zero. Okay. Perfectly symmetrical. All right. Now suppose we drop the assumption We drop the assumption that P is zero. Okay. So now let P be greater than zero. Well then for we got we're still going to solve this. We have some determinant, I'll call that D prime. Uh, and if the second order condition is, is satisfied in terms of the convexity being greater for the utility function, the indifference curves, than for the budget constraint, that's going to be required to make that zero. So it would be generalizing uh, the result that you just need uh, diminishing margin utility in a separable case. That's not sufficient. Okay? Now, if we now take, now we have the full equation, so we got to, you know, substitute that in and solve for the determinant in the numerator. And when we do that, it becomes pretty simple because of, uh, we have a zero in that equation of one here. So it's very simple. And the result would be just pulling that term down, basically. So VHH times PN plus PH. Here, let me p greater than zero, dn 
di equal bhh pn times pH plus pvh. Okay. That because we're bringing down that that term up there. That's what we're doing basically. See the right hand side term up there, pH, pvh plus etc. That's all we're bringing down. All right. We're changing the sign of it. Oh, it's negative there, now it's positive. All right, so what do we know? Well, if we had p equal to zero, we're back to this result. p equal to zero, dn di greater than zero. All right, but if p is positive, well then we have a negative term here and a positive term here. And if this term is greater than this term, then we can have a negative effect on H, on N. A negative effect on N. What about H? Could you have a negative effect on both? Clearly not. I mean, the two good case, it's obvious. But the multi-good case, it's also true. And I'll, give you, I'll show you why in a moment. Um, so what's going on here? Well, what's going on is, again, the interaction. That's why P is so crucial. P being positive is crucial. That's the interaction term. And what do I mean by the interaction? What I mean is that if P is positive, no. let's suppose we have income goes up and initially you increase both N and H. Think of it, thought experiment. All right, you increase N and H, but H increases by a lot. Okay. All right, N increases, let's say N increases by a little initially. Well, the increase in H by a lot is going to raise the price of shadow price of N. And a little increase in N is only slightly going to raise. So the relative price of N is going to rise. So an increase in income. See, we usually we think, well, we can separate income effects from price effects. And conceptually, you can, always. Always. All right? But in this case, usually we say, well, there's an increase in income in the ordinary simple theory of consumer choice, you increase income, your whole market price is fixed. Now, it gets more complicated if you have wages affecting the, the sort of full price, time allocation, and so on. Okay. Well, in this case, we aren't even talking about wages. Uh, but from the nature of the problem, uh, the prices are going to be endogenous, unlike in the wage case, where you, those are assumed to be exogenous as well. The prices are endogenous. And if you increase H by a lot initially and N by a little, you're increasing the price of N possibly, shadow price of N possibly by a lot relative to the price of H. And that's going to discourage you from consuming N. And it could be that discouragement effect is so big that an equilibrium actually consume less N. Nothing on, no, doesn't, no unstable equilibrium or anything required to get that result. It says the endogeneity of the N and H. Suppose it was true that in some sense, in the absence of this P term, it's a little tricky, but let me say, let's say in the absence of the P term, because of the great concavity in, in the U function, N does increase at all with income. Okay? Doesn't increase at all. Well, then if we bring in this interaction term, all you're going to see is an increase in the relative price of N, and you're going to have to have less consumption. So by bringing the P term in that case, you wouldn't necessarily get N going down. Uh, now the, in that particular case, that's interesting. Well, that would be K, an example of that here would be, another way of thinking about it would be that V is kind of linear. 
linear function. So all your income effect goes into V. You know, if you have if you have a utility function that depends upon some concave function of n and some and plus h or constant h, then all the marginal income effect goes into h, right? Because you don't have diminishing utility there. That would be a way to look at that instead of the way I the way I gave it. it, it it's true too, but it, it, it's a little more complicated. Okay, uh, that showed up in the determinant, basically. Uh, so, all right. So that would be the case. So, the one result we have is that you could have dn dh di go negative, even if no none of these market prices change, just income. So this is not unlike the wage case where your income may change because your wages change, so you have to bring in the time substitution effect. We're not having that here. Because it's a shadow effect. Now, why did I say you can't have a decrease in, in both of them? Which you can show quite easily. All right, suppose you had a lot of other goods. They're separable. As, uh, okay. what, what's going to go on? Well, how are we going to get the decrease in n? The only way we get the decrease in n is because h goes up by a lot. You can't get it any other way. But if h is going to go up by a lot, nothing's going to make h go down, too, when n is going down. So h has to rise if n is going down. I mean, with, with separability. Uh, because the so interactions is producing a decline in one, but it's raising the response to the other, not lowering raising the response to the other. So that's why this is a general, it would be true in general. You can have a third commodity. It'll work it out. Suppose there was a third commodity. I just didn't bring that in, but you can work out all these comparative statics with this, go back to the original Z function that we had of CP, uh, and everything goes through pretty much the same. You just have to deal with Determines three by three rather than two by two, but it's, it's simple. Okay, so that's the uh, income result. And the important thing here is that a rise in income, even if in some sense both n and h are superior, could look as if. And what's the sense? Well, suppose if you held the shadow prices fixed of n and h, and then we're true both n and h would go up if income rose. You have to compensate for the increase in H and N to call the shadow price fixed, but you could do that by compensating changes in the PH and the PN. In that case, you would get a rise in both N and H. It would be a compensated increase in income, a little bit complicated, complicated compensation. You would get it. And no question, you would get it. So you could get it. But we don't have, we're not doing it. That's not the experiment we're doing. That's not the reasonable experiment to be doing. No reason why we should be having that type of compensation. And that's how you can get uh, one of them going down and one of them going up. Now, you can also deal, and, we, and it's important to understand that similar results apply when you deal with price effects. I illustrated something geometrically before. But the reason price effects are important is that over time, as countries have developed, the value of time, the weight, human capital went up, that's relevant, but also the value of time went up. And the value of time affects, you think now of these P's as being a function of the value of time, maybe also the human capital of the parents. Okay? So, if parental human capital goes up, you may say, well, that's going to make it more effective investing in, in kids, all right? But it's also more costly. On the other hand, if you look at the fixed cost of having kids, that is going to be mainly a function of the value of time. It won't be a function of parental human capital to any large extent because you have to, just have to go through that period. There's no quality investment. So one way to think about these prices, and link it back to what we said earlier, the 
is to say that Pn is going to be a function of, yeah, okay, let me go back a little bit. Let's, let's write I is equal to alpha LH or is equal to LW. I of parents is equal to this parents, 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 parents. Okay? So we can say that Pn now, we say is a function, I tried to justify by saying Pn is a function of Wp, the, w the value of time of parents. Fixed cost of having children doesn't really depend uh, any similar way on the human capital of parents. Ph and P, they're functions of W, P, and H of P. Okay. And by that I mean, well, if parents' time is more valuable, we would think so. we have like this, D, P, P, and the same thing for P, H, D, P, D, W, P is greater than zero. This the net price you have to pay is a function of your wage rate, right? So it's more expensive, your time is more valuable, and then let's say you're reading to your kids, that's more, more expensive. Okay. On the other hand, we would expect DP, the age of parents, to be less than zero. They have more parental human capital. Remember, go back to very early in the term, the more productive are the parental investments in their kids. And there may be other variables that enter. Okay. So what can we say? Well now, think of the process of economic... Well, not... Suppose it were, take a simple case. Suppose it were true that, you, you notice from this equation that if we hold L fixed, that H of P and W of P rise by the same proportion. Okay? So then if we look at DP, that's going to be equal, what, P, W, D, W, I want to put M, P, H, D, H. Divide through by W here, and divide through and multiply through by W here, and divide through by H here, multiply through by H here. So we would have these would be the percentage change. These are going to be equal. So we would have let's call that delta W that DP is equal. Delta W, or delta W equal D log W equal D log H. So I'm going to factor that out. And I'm going to get delta DP is equal delta W times what? D.
Well, that's, that's it. So this, this term here, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, this is DP, this is W, all right, now I'm okay, something doesn't look like All right, so this is the percentage change in price with regard to a change in W, this is the percentage change in price with regard to a change in H, and these are approximately equal. This term here is negative, this term here is positive. They're approximately offset each other, and you might get that this thing here is approximately here. This is a derivative with respect to W, that sort of thing. My handwriting was confusing me. All right? So, on, on, on that approximation, you have an increase in parental earnings. You don't have any increase in P, and let's say a similar approximation with pH, but you do have an increase in P sub n, the fixed cost of having children. Now that approximation may not work, but you see there are offsetting forces on the cost of investing in human capital because of the role, the asymmetrical role of parental human capital in affecting the cost of investing in the quality of children as opposed to the fixed cost of investing in the quantity. The variable cost of affecting in the quantity is affected by that. So in that condition, you can say, well, let's say if you're looking at economic development that raises uh, the earnings of each parental generation and their human capital, and let's say approximately proportionally with the sim simple human capital model that we've had where earnings just are proportional to human capital and the hours work. Okay. If, you have, if you have that vision, then economic development is going to raise the child price of having additional children. It's not going to really, if these approximation is, is, is true, not going to affect the shadow price of investing in quality of children, it may even lower it. I mean, you can have all sorts of deviations from that. And then children become more expensive. Well, if you look at richer family, higher human capital families versus high, lower human capital families, having kids becomes more exp expensive. Even though we recognize that having more human capital makes you more productive on investing in each child, we're assuming they about, just about cancel each other out. So just like you're doubling your human capital doubles your productivity in the marketplace, that's what this wage equation assumes, we're assuming it basically doubles your productivity in, in uh, the household. So you just offset the increase in the cost of your time. Okay. That's a way to think about it. Okay. Well, under those assumptions, we can say, well, then we can analyze a problem as a consequence of the change in, we, we have this change in age of parent, parental human health, change in parental earning. That's basically what that tells us, yes, parental income rate rises. We've already gone through that. And in addition to that, there may be a relative price effect. Okay. And the relative price effect will be in a particular direction. We're raising the shadow price of N, or the market price of N, relative to H. Well, then we can, then we can say, let's, let's differentiate our first order conditions, and let, if this is approximately true, right? You don't look like you're following anything. Uh, I just, I'm struggling with the intuition that uh, wealthier households face higher variable costs. I and mean, correct me if I'm, my understanding is wrong. Um, but that wealthier households have higher variable costs for obtaining uh, education and parents with higher human capital have lower variable costs. Well, wealthier households, you mean they don't have higher human capital? They're just wealthier? Uh, what, I mean, 
they're just wealthier, and the wages are the same. We, you know, we don't have an extra term here, but we could have it. We could have, um, we're going to have some V in here, plus V, plus V. And if they just change V, then they don't change either the wage rate or the human capital. It's just a pure income effect, and we've gone through that. that would, our, our previous analysis would apply fully to that case. Okay. I don't know why you're struggling with that problem, because I haven't really discussed it, but that's fine. I mean, that's an easy problem to explain. That would be the case we dealt with before. Pure income change, nothing else changing, and we can show that N might go down. The wealth, how those are different simply in wealth, not in wages, they will have lower N and more human capital invested in each child. We know they have more human capital invested in each child. And we do know that um, throughout history that higher income households, they're not just wealthier, they're also wages, have lower fertility and more investment in each child. But maybe there's a price effect there too. That isn't just changing V. If you look cross-sectionally at families, so if you look at higher income families in, in any country, they're higher income because they have more human capital, maybe they have more V, more inherited income, have more savings and so on. But they have more human capital, more wages, higher wages, you got to deal with both those effects. Okay? What we're assuming for this analysis, I mean, it's not, we don't have to assume that for more general analysis, but just to make it start, we're assuming for this analysis that when we forget about other sources of wealth, when human capital rises and wages must rise in the same proportion, uh, even if that was true, even if we had other sources of wealth, that would be true in the simple model, right? And we and and this is a, uh, that, this is a, an assumption. Uh, that they, they affect the prices of quality, but they just about offset each other. One raises the price, one lowers the price. One makes you more productive, the other makes your time more expensive. It's a simple way to think about it. Right. So that view is approximately right. We would say if we're comparing higher income versus low income families, mainly differing, most, higher income, most of the difference between higher and lower income families in any country is due to differences in earning power not due to, due to differences in V, in inherited wealth or anything else. It's mainly due to earning power. But most of the income is due to earning power. It's only the top tail that has a big share of non-earning power. And you look over time, what mainly has happened, not only, but mainly has happened, is earning power went up. Good, true, capital accumulated, physical capital is accumulated, that went up too. Uh, but earning power remained, and in fact, a growing fraction of total income because of investments in human capital. Not only remained important, but it became more important. So the share of income going to earnings is higher in richer countries typically than in poorer countries. Right? So what I want to say then is, well, we, if we had well, all this is just to say that we can deal with the problems we've been dealing with by saying, suppose we had a change delta Pn, P sub A. We want to now look at how the whole system responds to that, maybe compensating the income. Let's suppose you think about it as a compensated income change. By that I mean you keep consumers on the same utility level. So you're changing the cost of having additional ch children but by keeping them on the same utility level. And the way you're changing the cost is by changing the fixed cost, P of N, based on our analysis. Well, what would happen? Well, tr traditional theory would say linear budget constraints, I'm calling that traditional theory, linear budget constraints, you'd say, well, PN goes up, N goes down, right? H goes up in general. I mean, you may have, uh, in a separable case, all the other goods will tend to go up. Okay. They'll all be substitutes. Okay, so what do we say? Well, we're not saying anything qualitatively any different than that with respect to price. PN goes up, 
you start having less N, just like with a linear budget constraint, you're raising H. But then we get a further reinforcement. As, as N goes down and H goes up, that lowers further the shadow price of H and raises further the shadow price of N, and you keep going. That's the example I gave before when, when you're chasing the your tail is chasing itself along between the budget constraint and the uh, indifference curve. Okay? And so you may get a very big effect from a modest change. That's what's important. The more important the interaction, the bigger is the sort of additional effects compared to the initial effects. Okay. So, so why does that make any difference? Well, it makes a difference for the following reasons. The same thing true. Now we have two results. Let's say um, we're going to put them. We have maybe we saw I didn't say that's a guaranteed result, but it could be true. Income rises and These effects are going to be big. The US, I put them in the elasticity form, they're going to be large because of the interaction effect. Now, you know, that's a rough statement, but you, you can see the mechanism driving that. Okay. And as we, we go back to that diagram we had, So you might say, so what? Always say, so what, when you hear anything. Uh, so it's up to somebody to show why it can be important. And why do I think this is important? Uh, I think it's important because we observe very large changes in fertility and investment in human capital, either over time, over short periods of time, I'll give you some examples, or across families at any moment in time. So, for example, you take Taiwan, between the period 1960 and 1980, fertility was cut in half. And you find similar pictures in Korea, other Asian countries. China is a little bit difficult to analyze because it had a one-child family, so some of that was forced. I think you would have had a big decline in fertility anyway in China, probably not as much as we actually have observed uh, because of the one-child type of policies. Okay. But you look at Japan, very rapid declines in a short period of time. Okay. You look at Eastern Europe, very rapid declines in a short period of time. Um, even in India, as India began to grow, its fertility was at very high levels, come down a lot. So 
It's a little surprise you get to such a fundamental decision. How many children you want to have? Okay? Such a fundamental decision you get such big changes, uh, historically unprecedented changes over two decades. That's nothing. That's, uh, that's no, nothing in, in terms of time periods. It's true these countries were growing pretty rapidly then, but still to see such a dramatic change in such a big variable. So how do you explain it? I mean, that, that's the challenge. Okay? At least that's what I always felt was the challenge in trying to understand what's going on. So there are various approaches. And what I've done alone doesn't prove which one is the right approach. You can say, well, birth control knowledge increased by a lot. You got the pill and so on. But Japan outlawed the pill until recently and had a big decline in fertility. Okay. And so you had, and yet in Taiwan you had big declines in fertility before they were using much incidence of the pill. So I, I think the bill, pill did have an important impact, but I don't think you can explain this, these huge declines simply by the development of more effective contraception, although that was an input in. But that's, that's often an alternative that uh, people put forward. Um, another argument made is, well, yeah, growing empowerment of women. Well, not that much in Japan, let me say, until very recently. Uh, but even so, what's endogenous and what's exogenous? You did have it, but what was the, you know, what was the causes of it? Was it the growth of income and so on that led to lower demand for fertility, led to higher demand for education, that made women earn more and uh, have more power? I mean, that's a tough question. I'm not going to claim that everybody knows exactly the answer to that, but surely it's partly endogenous. All right, so these are partial stories. Maybe they're the main story. I believe the main story is somewhat different, that you have that you change the optimal size of fertility as you change with economic development across family. Now, it's partly due to the fact that women get more education and time is more valuable. So that's a part of this analysis. I'm not saying that's not an important part of this analysis. It is part of this analysis. Because if you, if what wage rate do we have there? If it's mainly women who, who certainly are bearing the kids and rearing them, then their, their wage rate is going to be certainly important not maybe the husbands as well, but certainly important. So I'm not excluding that. That's an important part of the analysis. But that the, and that you didn't have such, you have to have such big changes to get big effects because of this interaction. And it's, it's not, therefore you should expect one crude test of this. If this interaction is what's really so powerful, you should expect to find that if you go across families in a moment in time in a country, the rich, higher income families have both lower fertility and higher investments per child. And you do find that. Fertility effect is important and the investment effect is important. Both are important. So that doesn't prove this is what's going on, but it's consistent with it. Because if people say, well, why should a higher income people have fewer children? children are children an inferior good? You don't want to have to say that, right? So we have a, a more complicated way of explaining why that's happened. Children are a superior good if you held the shadow prices constant. But they're an inferior good in this now if you just look at market prices. That's, and plus there's a price effect, which it also moves them in opposite directions. So we say cross-sectionally we would expect that. Over time we would expect as countries develop, as the human capital and other capital increases, you should find fertility falling, which is exactly what you do. In fact, Murphy, I, and somebody called Robert Tamura have a paper written a number of years ago where we formalized that into a model. I'll come back to that a little bit. And the model shows, predicts fully that fertility must be declining as human capital accumulation is, is rising. So that's what you, uh, you would expect. In another cut of the day, you'd expect to find richer countries compared to poorer countries. Richer countries had lower fertility and higher investments per children. 
and you find that very strongly on the whole. I mean, there are a few exceptions, but not much. So the fact that these things change go in the negative <coughs> direction to each other, at least is consistent. Now people say, well, you've got to use more sophisticated techniques to pin it down. I agree with that. So people have looked at twins, and when it, if you get the uh, last child as a twin, an unexpected increase in fertility, what does that do to uh, human capital investment? And a, and a variety of other techniques to try to separate out more precisely and in a more econometric fashion, the quality quantity interaction. And it's, a, it's an ongoing literature, uh, still going on. But the basic results we see seem consistent with the notion that one going up, the other is going down. We wouldn't say when human capital investment goes up, people spending on cars go down, it goes up. So why is fertility so different? That's a challenge. Yeah. I mean, you have to speak louder, Christine. Uh, so, you said there's a literature on twins identifying the impact of fert unexpected fertility on, on uh, human capital investment, and is there a consensus on that literature that the human capital investment goes down? As what? Is there a consensus? A consensus? No, no, not, uh, you know, no part of economic literature can you say there's full consensus. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't say there's consensus. But I think for the bulk of the literature people have shown, uh, have shown like the, even the recent papers, by Rosenzweig with the Chinese data, which was dealing with twins. First time the twin data was used for China has shown a striking negative relationship when they brought in twins in terms of the uh, link between fertility and human capital investments. Now there are some papers, mainly using U.S. data, that you say, well, you do it this way, you don't find it. So it, it, there's some dispute over it. But I think the bulk of the papers do show it, not only for the United States. The Chinese data are most interesting in some ways because they have the largest sample of twins I think that have ever been put together. It's a big country, so you can get a lot, you can get a lot, of, a lot of sample points. So I would recommend it. There's Rosenzweig and Zhang and somebody else. Okay. Yeah? I don't, I don't know if there are data for this, but have you observed open break the, as, I don't know, prolonged economic slumps have caused an increase in fertility? Like economic slump? Yeah. Well, yeah, a good question. You want to distinguish temporary changes from permanent changes. We've been talking about permanent changes. Now, if you're in a slump, you think your income is low now, it's going to be higher in the future, then you may uh, uh, delay having children now, right, uh, and have them in the future. If, uh, we know people delay marriage during slumps. Well, you think it's uncertain what the income prospects will be, so people hold off getting married. They all having their, their first child uh, in part for the same reasons, more uncertainty, uh, you know, financing it maybe becomes more difficult if you're unemployed. So typically there's been a cyclical, pro-cyclical movement in fertility, in, in current fertility and birth rates. And now people tend to make that up when times get better. So when you have bad times, they have lower, and, and good times, they have better. So I, I think you have to draw a distinction between the uh, what's sometimes called cohort fertility and period fertility, or, you know, what the, what the cohort is, uh, a, a, a individual, a woman or a couple, are planning to do over their cohort, over their life experience, and know what they're going to do in a particular year when they're faced with particular shocks. So there's some evidence that during this recession, birth rates went down. That's what I would predict. I mean, I once wrote a paper on, on that, uh, on the cyclical aspects, and it, if you look historically, it's very strong pro-cyclical. Much of that is on first birth because marriage is so pro-cyclical. What if you know that it's going to be prolonged? If you, don't, if you know what? It's going to be a long... If so you know it's going to be permanent, I would take eventually you would see uh, effect, effect going the opposite way. Now, there are many examples of things like that. Depends on what you mean by prolonged. Take the Great Depression. That was a decade. Fertility was low, started coming back up. Uh, toward the end of the 30s, uh, but still was below, and then boomed afterwards. There's a lot of uncertainty throughout the 30s how long it was going to be. That's the way I would explain the 30s. Okay? Any other? These are good questions. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, I, I guess I don't quite understand with that. Um, if you are unemployed, you know, if, if, there's, a, if there's a bus and you think you're going to be unemployed, um, wouldn't that produce your shadow price of... It would. That's his question. 
That was his question. Right, but I mean, so you're saying you, you delay having children? Oh, that's it. Remember, that's his question. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you don't like the answer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. The delay force would go in that direction. That's what he was saying. Right. All right, so you have to say, are there other forces that might be offsetting it that lead people to say, well, this is not the right time right. to have it? Um, and that's right, I mean, when, when much of birth, not all anymore as much, but still a lot, follow marriage, well, people say, well, we're going to delay marriage during a uh, bad time. That's a very powerful relationship, right? And they may also say, well, we're married, but it's costly to have kids. Let's not have them at this moment, even though our time is cheaper. So there are conflicting forces. And some people, you ask Christine about people find other results. Some, there have been a couple of studies that have found that while births used to be pro-cyclical, now they're counter-cyclical. But generally speaking, that, those results have been overturned by later results that have continued to found pro-cyclicality in birth rates. But that is a force going in that other direction. All right, anything else? Well, one, yeah. Pardon me? Have you uh, heard of data showing that there's recent increase in fertility? Very small increase. Very small increase. Uh, and if one doesn't know if it's, um, it's going to be permanent or, or not. Um, it, it started before the recession. Uh, and if you look at by education level, we, we had a student who started doing a dissertation on this, finally felt there wasn't enough there. He found the education fertility of educated people rose somewhat relative to fertility of less educated people. But it was really small compared to the real negative relationship by education level. Uh, so is that a, is that going to, is that a, a, you know, a harbinger of something major that's coming? Nobody knows yet. My belief is it won't have a big effect. It's not going to be a big return to high fertility levels. Uh, that, that's my own prediction because I think the fundamental forces against it are strong. Now, will you have some wiggling around, you know, low fertility? Yeah, that, that you may have. So maybe Italy will go from 1.2 to 1.3, which is not trivial, but they'll still have very low fertility. But, you know, those are things, you know, if you ask why did this happen, again, it, it's a little tricky with the difference between po cohort and period fertility. More educated women have their children later, and they have them closer together. And so, you know, maybe... Earlier, you were seeing, well, women were rapidly increasing their education. Maybe you saw what looked like a decline in their lower fertility as educated women, but they were just the fact that they're having them later and they're picking them up later. So you have to really look at ultimately at cohort fertility. And I think if you look at cohort fertility, you'll find a strong narrative relationship between women's education and so on. Women, more educated women do have fewer children in every society that's been looked at. Maybe the gap has gotten smaller but there's nowhere near the fertility of, let's say, high school dropout women have. They have much higher fertility. All right, I want to make one last point before, one last data observation, which I think is really important. If you look at what's been going on in the world since 1970, and we have good data on education, we have on fertility in the world. So since 1970, Show you, I'll draw you a map of what's been going on. If you look at fertility, total fertility rate. This is Africa, down quite a bit, but still much higher. And this is the rest of the world, pretty similar on the average, Europe being the lowest. This is Europe, the low replacement, total fertility rate approximately 1.6 or 7. And the rest of the world, everybody else is bunched in, pretty much, North America, etc. So, that's fertility. 
you look at education, education, college. Really boom. High income. High income. Low income. They have not drawn it really. So what you've had over this period of time, and you do the same thing for secondary education, less dramatic. Big boom in worldwide boom in education, secondary and higher education, and a worldwide dearth in births. Is that an accident? Is that an accident? That they, one went up a lot, the other went down a lot. Well, this analysis, Jay, is not an accident. That there are forces that are going on that raised, and we, we would add another force. Remember what we said earlier, which I haven't really said as yet. If, if we look at, let's say, our price variables, P, we said, well, P is a function of W parent and H parent. And let's say I'm going to call this the rate of return on H. Okay. So the rate of return on H has gone up, right? That was the thing we stressed a lot in the class. Worldwide. Look at worldwide data. The rate of return has gone up. That's lowered the price of investing in human capital. Okay. Doesn't affect much the fixed cost of investing in kids. So what do we see? We see a big boom in, high, in education, especially higher education, but also secondary, and a significant drop in fertility. Why? Well, the, hey, think of this as a causal chain. There's an exogenous increase in returns to investment in human capital due to technologies and the like. I'll call that exogenous. That hits first the incentive to invest in human capital. That raises H, raises W, and that knocks, raises P of N, the cost of N, and the shadow price of N, and N goes down a lot. To me, that's the way to look at what's going on. Now, we have a, a nice mechanism, um, and there's, uh, we, we're involved here in doing some more work trying to pin that down more precisely, and we, we we can print it down there somewhat more precisely. And it does appear to be true that there's this big relationship between N and H as it's operating worldwide, not just within a country, but worldwide. And the effects are, are, are enormous. I mean, you've seen very big effects. You did see very big effects. So if you ask how many countries now have fertility rates that are below replacement, what would your answer be? Seventy. How many? Seventy. Yeah. Close but too low, but close, uh, close to 80. What fraction of the world's population? But close, you, uh, you get a B plus on that one. <laughs> <laughs> what fraction of the world's population is in such countries? 45%. That counts China, China's 20%, so that's big. Well, why not count China? The only reason not to count it is not fully voluntary in China. So that's the hard part. And a good project to figure out how much is and isn't. I think a lot of China's fallen births would have occurred now without any uh, pressure to have a one-child policy. But I think they've gone further than you would you would have. But anyway, 45% of the world, whatever reason, is now in below replacement fertility. That's enormous, right? That's every European country, without exception, pretty much, without exception, that's Western Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe. It's only when you get to the Muslim free countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union you find any exception to that. Okay. Otherwise, it's true in all of them. Right. Many Europe, uh, uh, Asian countries, not all by any means. And scattered countries, uh, Canada in North America, and a few South American countries, not too many. Right. So uh, I think we can say something about why that's happening. And this is the way I, uh, I say it, okay?